grace over us in this nation. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign, and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we thy unworthy servants here to God together, in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send on thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultation, and grant that we have in thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affection. The result of all our counsel may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Honorable members, since our last sitting, we've had the, the sad news of the passing of Kimani Rivia, son to independent Senator Mauricio Thomas Francis. He was laid to rest yesterday. I ask every member if we, you have not reached out to Senator, our parliamentary colleagues, to do so. And I know you will join me in extending condolences to Senator Mauricio Thomas and the family. Honorable members, take, you may have realized with the increasing number of the COVID cases, we are now putting new protocols, or we are trying to attempt to put new protocols in place in the Parliament. We've not gotten to the position that we would like to be, but you will notice the two podiums to the side. All members wishing to speak will so indicate, as usual, by turning on their lights, but members will move away from a sitting position and go to the podium to speak. Every member in the house, in the chamber, must wear the mask at all times. If you're not going to, then we'll be asked to step aside, to step out of the chamber. Statements by minister, from ministers. Speaker, Prime Minister. Um, before I begin my, my statement, let me join you in expressing the government's uh, condolences for Senator Mauricia Thomas and the passing of her son. Also, I understand that um, a long-standing engineer of this country, Mr. Oliver Scott Jr., 
also passed this morning, so if I can extend condolences to his family and his friends on this, on this passing. The government of St. Lucia declared a state of emergency on March 23, 2020, in accordance with subsection of subs, with, subs, with section 17 of the Constitution of the St. Lucia. Subsection 17.2 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 101, outlines the conditions under which the Governor General may declare a state of emergency. Subsection 17.2b of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 101, states, and I quote, a proclamation under this section shall not be effective unless it contains a declaration that the Governor General is satisfied that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of any earthquake, hurricane, flood, fire, outbreak of pestilence, or of infectious disease, or any other calamity, whether similar to the foregoing. End of quote. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic on March 11, 2020. This was due to the fact that the coronavirus had begun to impact countries worldwide across international boundaries. And at the time, there were more than 118,000 confirmed cases in 114 countries and 4,291 deaths had been recorded. COVID-19 was a new strain of coronavirus at the time. The information surrounding the spread, treatment, and mortality from the disease was very limited back then. The government of St. Lucia being acutely aware of the level of preparedness suppressed by resource constraints, particularly with respect to our healthcare system, took the decision to utilize the powers granted under seven, Section 17 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 101, and declared a state of emergency under the Emergency Powers Disasters COVID-19 Order, Statutory Instrument Number 42 of 2020. The timely declaration of the state of emergency by the authorities in March 2020 assisted in achieving the following lawfully restricting the movement of people for a period of time, thereby slowing the spread of the virus, restricting overseas travel of persons, thereby lessening the likelihood of further exposure to the virus locally, lawfully restricting the movement of people across the country for a period of time, 758 and 759 to be exact, thereby allowing the necessary contact tracing to be performed efficiently and effectively, allowing the Ministry of Health sufficient time to commission the respiratory hospital, which is now equipped for care for COVID-19 patients. Allowing the Ministry of Health, supported by international organizations and the global community, more time to study and understand COVID-19, thereby being able to recommend the appropriate protocols for reducing the likelihood of the spread of the virus. And introducing the necessary protocols which would be effective in combating the spread of the virus, such as physical, physical distancing and the wearing of face masks in public. Subsection 11.1 of the Emergency Powers Disaster COVID-19 Order, Statutory Instrument Number 42 of 2020, provides for the further waiver of the application of any rule of law governing the procurement of goods and services by the competent authority in consultation with the minister responsible for finance. Further, subsection 11.2 requires the minister for finance to lay a report before the House of Assembly within six weeks of the expiration of the declaration of the state of emergency, detailing the expenditure undertaken to procure goods and services and providing justification for the application, the applicable procurement activity. Whilst the waiver for the application of any rule of law governing procurement was never utilized, 
and no such order was issued by the Minister for Finance, a report has been prepared to provide information as it relates to the provisions of subsection 11.2 of the Emergency Powers Disasters COVID-19 Order, statutory instrument number 42 of 2020. This was felt necessary in order to support the government's efforts gear, geared towards enhanced transparency and public accountability. The report presents the data compiled on the procurement of goods and services during the state of emergency in relation to the government of St. Lucia's COVID-19 response. The data was compiled from the procurement authority registers. These registers include four levels of procurement authority. Transactions valued under 50,000. These are procurement transactions that are authorized by the accounting officers at the ministries, departments, and agencies. Transactions valued from $50,001 to $100,000, the Department Tenders Board is, is the body that authorizes these procurement transactions. Transactions are valued above $100,000, the Central Tenders Board is the authority for all transactions above $100,000. And direct procurement, this is an alternative means for procurement awarded for goods and services. Direct procurement is authorized by the Minister of finance. It should be noted that the total expenditure for the goods and services procured during the state of emergency for the COVID-19 response is estimated at 15,400,000 across all central procuring entities. The majority of individual procurement transactions recorded during the state of emergency relate to health, the health sector. These include the supply of respiratory masks for the treatment of COVID-19 patients, the purchase of re reagents for testing and surgical masks and body suits for physicians and healthcare workers, the supply of personal protective equipment, airfares, lodging and accommodation for the Cuban Medical Brigade, comprising of doctors and nurses who assisted in the initial stages of the response, materials and equipment for testing, boarding and lodging of persons in quarantine and isolation centers, boarding and lodging persons who provided support during the period, retrofitting of the Victoria Hospital for the conversion to a respiratory hospital, retrofitting of other medical facilities and refurbishment of the arrival hall in the, at the airports. Other significant direct procurement activities include water tanks, acquired to assist with water storage for increased sanitation and computers and equipment to facilitate the e-learning for students across the country. We spent about $3.2 million on medical equipment, $1.5 million on personal protective equipment, $1.1 million for medical materials and supplies for testing, 890,000 for airfare lodging accommodation for the Cuban Medical Brigade. Accommodation for persons in quarantine and isolation centers, 4.6 million. Retrofitting of health facilities, 550,000. Water tanks, 1.1 million. Computers and equipment to facilitate e-learning, $2.3 million. The total is $15,389,450 and the actual breakdown of those numbers is provided. Um, the procurement under 50,000 relate to the day-to-day -day operations of the individual ministers, departments, and agencies. During the state of emergency, an increase in the purchase of hygienic products, cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers, gloves, and face masks was recorded. They were especially noted in the sectors uh, that interact directly with the public, such as Customs and Excise Department, the Inland Revenue Department, the Accountant General's Department, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, the Department of Education, the Department of Home Affairs, Fire and Police. Given the eminent threat to public health, welfare and safety, most of the procurement activities for the COVID-19 response were authorized through direct procurement, which accounted for 98% of the total procurement activity during the state of emergency period. The remaining 
was authorized at the level of the accounting officer or permanent secretary. In the case of two categories of hygienic supplies, hand sanitizers and face masks, which are requirements under the National Protocol for COVID-19, there was an increase in procurement from domestic suppliers. These items were treated as specialized and were required. The relevant procurement authority was provided. The ministries, departments, and agencies engage in local seamstresses to produce re reusable face masks for their staff. The hand sanitizers and cleaning supplies were procured from Barbie Limited, Natmel Limited, Chemical Manufacturing and Investment Company Limited, and Atwell Daligesh Limited. For major medical equipment and supplies, the Ministry of Health procured equipment from external suppliers such as the Caribbean Diagnostics and Intercontinental Pharma Incorporated and domestic suppliers such as Express Medical Group Incorporated. The principal factors that determine the selection of the supplies, the suppliers of the goods and services were one, the ability of the suppliers to deliver the goods in the requisite shortest time, the existing relationships with suppliers, the supplier's willingness to accept for more flexible payment arrangements and extended more favorable credit terms at minimal cost, no additional financing charges. The list of suppliers who were contracted for the goods and services procured during the period, the said period, is a, appended to this appendix. For the purpose of this report, domestic suppliers refer to companies, businesses, and or individuals registered in St. Lucia and external suppliers refer to companies, businesses, and or individuals registered outside of St. Lucia. The oversight of the public procurement function falls under the supervision of the Department of Finance. It should be noted that this report does not assess the effectiveness, relevance, or efficiency of the procurement transactions that were conducted during the state of emergency, as this was not the primary objective of this exercise. Not to say it's not important. Department of Finance wishes to note that the level of data analytics undertaken in the preparation of this report was limited due to the challenges encountered in sourcing, compiling, and analyzing the data obtained from the procurement agencies. Notwithstanding, the Department of Finance is committed to instituting appropriate reporting standards and providing guidance to other government agencies as it relates to the compilation of the requisite data to enable relevant complete and timely reporting. The Office of the Director of Finance is currently championing the initiative to improve the data analytics for the purpose of reporting on the public procurement to the relevant authorities. This is part of the broader reform in public procurement being undertaken by the Department, the rollout of which will be communicated to all stakeholders. Thank you. Papers to be laid. Go ahead. We're doing it here, the podium. Speaker, the following papers to be laid in my name. Statutory instrument number 151 of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control, physical distancing order. Statutory instrument number 152 of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control wearing of mask regulations. Statutory instrument number 153 of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control prohibition of assembly order. Statutory Instrument Number 154 of 2020, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Declaration of Quarantine Facility Order. Statutory Instrument Number 155 of 2020, 
COVID-19 prevention and control, approval of test for COVID-19 and the designation of laboratory order. Statutory instrument number 157 of 2020. Legal profession eligibility Lorraine Felicia Tugwell order. Statutory instrument number 158 of 2020. Legal profession eligibility David Robert Kitson Sharp order. Statutory instrument number 159 of 2020. Legal profession eligibility Jordan Alexander James Jarrett order. Statutory instrument number 160 of 2020. Legal profession eligibility Candace Renee Fletcher order. Statutory instrument number 162 of 2020. Excise tax amendment of schedule one number 14 order. Statutory instrument number 162A of 2020. COVID-19 prevention and control fees regulations. Statutory instrument number 163 of 2020. Legal profession eligibility, Kimberly Kai Williams order. Statutory instrument number 163A of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control, physical distancing amendment order. Statutory instrument number 163B of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control, prohibition of assembly amendment order. Statutory instrument number 164 of 2020, customs duties, amendment of schedule four number two order. Statutory instrument number 165 of 2020, fiscal incentives, Blue Waters St. Lucia Limited, order. Statutory instrument number 165A of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control restriction of access to area, order. Statutory instrument number 165B of 2020, COVID-19 prevention and control, physical distancing number two, order. Statutory instrument number 165C, of 2020 COVID-19 prevention and control prohibition of assembly number two order statutory instrument number 167 of 2020 excise tax amendment of schedule one number 15 order statutory instrument number 171 of 2020 companies amendment regulations Minister for Commerce, Industry, Enterprise, Development, and Consumer Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 161 of 2020, price control amendment number 15 order. Statutory instrument number 166 of 2020, price control amendment number 16 order. St. Lucia Bureau of Standards Annual Report 2018-2019. Thank you. Honorable Minister for Tourism, mm -hmm. Information and Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 168 of 2020, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Union Hilltop Paradise Villas Order. Statutory instrument number 169 of 2020, Tourism Incentives, First Class Transportation Services Order. Statutory instrument number 170 of 2020, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Heba Limited Order.
Honorable Prime Minister. Speaker, I also want to um, lay before the House the report of the Parliamentary Commissioner 2017 to 2019. Motions. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas under section 102, sorry, my apologies. Whereas under section 10.2 of the Value Added Tax Act, Cap 1542, the Act, it is provided the Minister responsible for finance may by order specifically specify the rate of tax for goods and services provided by hotels and other providers in the tourism sector. And whereas it is further provided under Section 10.4 of the Act that the order made pursuant to Section 10 of the Act is subject to an affirmative resolution of Parliament. And whereas the Minister responsible for finance seeks the approval of the draft value add tax rate tourism sector goods and services order to vary the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services by an affirmative resolution of Parliament to set the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services as follows. The rate of 7% applies with regard to a supply of tourism accommodation service. The rate of 10% applies with regard to the supply of food of beverages, including alcoholic beverages by a restaurant, water sports, tours conducted by land or sea within the St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of their tour packages, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by a tour operator, admission to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. Be it resolved that the Parliament, by the affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax rate, tourism sector goods and services order, to vary the rate of tax for goods and services provided by a hotel and other providers in the tourism sector to set the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services as follows. A, the rate of 7% tax applies with regard to a supply of tourism accommodation service. B, the rate of 10% applies for, with regard to the supply of one, food and beverage, including alcoholic beverages by a restaurant. Two, water sports. Three, tours conducted by land, air, sea within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of the tour package but excluding an indirect supply of transportation service by a tour operator, admission to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. Mr. Speaker, the resolution before Parliament seeks approval for the reduction of the VAT rate on the supply of services for sleeping accommodation in the tourism sector. Whether or not this sleeping accommodation is packaged with, uh, with or other hotel services. The intention is simply for the accommodation service um, that currently attracts a VAT rate of 10% to attract a VAT rate of 7%. Mr. Speaker, part of the government's policy to reform the financing arrangements for its tourism institutions, an accommodation fee was introduced as the modality by which destination marketing, management, and development could be self-financed. The intention is for the Solution Tourism Authority to no longer rely on central government subventions to finance it op its operations. The proposed reduction in VAT is simply to offset the proposed accommodation fee that will be collected by the accommodation sector. This accommodation fee is also before the Parliament today for approval. Mr. Speaker, our primary goal as a government is to assist in minimizing any increase in the price of accommodation on the island. Whilst transferring costs associated with destination marketing, management and development to the tourism sector. We are aware of the competitive nature of tourism sector and we do not want to see the attractiveness of St. Lucia as a tourism destination decline 
as a result of price increases. Mr. Speaker, our tourism sector is, in continu is continuing to grow and develop, and the time is right for the destination marketing management and development components to be fully financed and managed by the sector. This strategy will leave, relieve the pressure of central government expenditure whilst allowing St. Lucia as a destination to continue to enjoy world-class destination marketing management and development. Mr. Speaker, it is important to emphasize that the reduction in the VAT rate from 10% to 7% is only on the service of the sleeping accommodation and all other tourism related goods and services will continue to attract a VAT rate of 10%. This, as I said before, is to maintain our price competitiveness as a tourism destination. Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that our arrivals and bed nights are below normal levels at the moment due to COVID-19 pandemic. However, I am confident that once the sector recovers fully in the coming months, the net effect of these measures is that the normal pre-COVID levels of revenue will return to the tourism sector. In fact, we anticipate that our destination will eventually become more competitive with, more, with these measures being implemented and taking root. Mr. Speaker, international travel is expected to rebound in the coming months once the COVID-19 pandemic is brought under control and obviously the reality of that now, Mr. Speaker, with the announcement of, by Pfizer and some other companies that they do in fact have a vaccine of which they are trying to roll out as early as December, obviously is giving more credibility to that notion. We're not saying that COVID-19 will go away anytime soon, but we remain determined not to only coexist with COVID-19, but to provide our beloved nation every chance at a meaning, meaningful economic recovery. It is with this commitment that this resolution presented to this Honorable House for approval. Mr. Speaker, I want to re-emphasize that this was intended to be a tax-neutral um, transaction. So by reducing the, seven, the, the VAT rate from 10% to 7%, the 3% that they would have normally been paying, they're now going to pay in the form of a head tax, which will be in a bill that will be coming later today. The difference between the 3% the and what they're going to pay on absolute terms, for the most part, is neutral. In some instances, the hotelier might gain, and in some instances, the hotelier might lose. But it, at all times, these are fees that are being currently paid for by the consumer. Um, and we are satisfied that we're moving in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. The ability for the Tourism Authority now not to have to depend on an annual subvention from government, but in fact now getting their own revenue stream directly through this head tax um, is a meaningful step in the right direction. Um, as a former director of tourism, a former minister of tourism, and also now as a minister of finance, it has been very difficult, Mr. Speaker, um, to cash flow the needs of the tourism authority um, in a manner in which it meets their needs. Um, so again, the more success tourism is going to have, it will then be assured that it will continue to get those resources. And as a Minister of Finance, and certainly as Cabinet colleagues, having to go through the budgetary process and to cause or to debate as to how much money should go into the marketing of tourism relevant, relevant to how much money should go into healthcare, education, security, which are very important issues in our country, this will all of a sudden offset that. In terms of best practices, Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, in fact, works very similarly. Um, the revenues that the SLASPA agency gets from the airport tax, as well as other fees, go directly to SLASPA and allows SLASPA to have its own board and its own um, budget. And therefore, the capital expenditure that are required in that sector are not confined by um, the financial act that we have in St. Lucia. So with that, Mr. Speaker, um, this is something that has come to the House previously, and um, we did not debate it. We withheld it because of some problems that we had with some of our other bills, but we are putting it forward today so we can proceed with the implementation of the new head tax regime for the hotel sector 
and the funding of the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax, rate of tax, tourism sector goods and services order to vary the rate of tax for goods and services provided by a hotel and other providers in the tourism sector to set the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services as follows. A. The rate of 7% tax applies with regard to a supply of tourism accommodation service. B. The rate of 10% tax applies with regard to a supply of 1. Food and beverages, including alcoholic beverages by a restaurant. 2. Water sports. 3. Tours conducted by land, air, or sea within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of the tour package, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by a tour operator. Four, admission to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this motion seeks to reduce the value added tax on accommodation from 10% to 7%. But what's the problem, Mr. Speaker? The value added tax on all other tourism services remains, remains the same. What that means is that the small hotel here will still pay on his food and beverage 10%. The restaurants will, su will still pay their 10%. The two operators will still pay their 10%. I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that in these times it would be necessary to have an overall mm. reduction to all sectors so that the tourism industry that the Prime Minister seems to think, in spite of all what is said by everyone else, will rebound about the year, the earliest, the year 2023. In St. Lucia, we have a special wisdom, a special set of knowledge that the world works in our favor and in spite of the reality we continue to see the same things well mr speaker i also want to note that the all-inclusive industry will benefit from that reduction in vat because the services sold by the all-inclusive industry include water sports include food and beverage and could tours so the all-inclusive industry will get a reduction from, from the 10% to 7%, but, but the other hotels that do not give, that, that do not provide the services that are not all-inclusive will not get a reduction on the services that they, that they provide. So the all-inclusive industry will have a disproportionate advantage to the other, the other sectors, particularly the hotels that do not offer an all-inclusive package. Mr. Speaker, the small operators, the only benefit that they get from VAT is a benefit that we, as a government, when we put the VAT threshold and the income had to be less than $400,000 per year, that is the only benefit that the small operators will get, and that's the benefit that they continue to get. So this, this reduction does not benefit this small operator, it doesn't benefit the small hotels, it doesn't benefit the tour companies, but exclusively 
the accommodation sector, and more importantly, the all-inclusive sector. That is what that is where the benefits come. The restaurants that have got absolutely no no relief continue to have to pay their continue to have to pay their ten percent VAT. The restaurants continue, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker also the the fact that we are speaking a revival of the industry. We, we would have thought that the government would have also reduced the VAT for these ancillary sectors also. I mean, Mr. Speaker, whilst I'm on my feet about VAT, I still await the elimination of VAT as promised by the five to stay alive. I still hope that as time is getting, as time is near, the government will meet their promise of, elimin of eliminating VAT as the promise to the election of St. Lucia. And that was, that was the basis on which they won their, their, their re-election. So that, that, that token reduction that will benefit the agricultural sector more than any other sector is welcomed, but the government should not believe that it's such a great achievement and they go on and continue their, their, their boasting of doing this and doing that. It's, it, it, it's a small step, but does not, in any overall fashion, it does not help the entire tourism sector, not even the accom accommodation sector that does not provide an all-inclusive service. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. Member for Castro South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I join you in extending condolences to our parliamentary colleague who lost her son, and I think many of us in here would be very familiar with him, and we certainly want to offer some strength in times like this. I think the member from Miku South recognized the death of a long-standing engineer who happens to be, um, and I assume it's the same person he was speaking about, a very outstanding servant of cricket and of St. Lucian politics, albeit from the St. Lucian Labour Party. And we certainly want to, as his comrades on this side, offer strength to his family in this moment of distress. Mr. Speaker, I just want to offer a few words on the resolution. And like the leader of the opposition, member of Castries is, one in theory would not have difficulty and challenges with assistance being offered to sectors to make them more competitive and to enhance their own performances. But Mr. Speaker, we're starting to see in the application of a VAT regime in St. Lucia a multiplicity of rates. So there's a 7% rate, there's a 10% rate, and a 12.5% rate. And the whole concept of the VAT, Mr. Speaker, is really, is really contrary to this. A VAT in its universal application is really supposed to be applied as value added across the economy and government ought to find other ways and means of incentivizing sectors that are targeted, Mr. Speaker. 
And I'm trying to understand why is this necessary? Why is there a reduction in the VAT rate for accommodation services? And I think from listening to the member from Miku South, he kind of suggested this will make us more competitive. Because if the same rate will apply to all the other services offered in the tourism sector, but only accommodation is reduced, and I'm asking whether the reduction in 3% is going to make them more competitive, and this is how we are incentivizing the hospitality sector, and hotels in particular. Again, I'm trying to listen to the member from Miku South, because he's saying the same VAT rate would apply to all other services offered. So there is one service that is being targeted, only one, from my understanding. Again, I may be wrong, and I do not fully understand how it is presented, but it seems to be hotels, and there is a reduction in the, the VAT on accommodation. And maybe the member from Ancillary can raise, or the member from Eco South can further explain to solutions and explain, am I right or wrong? And is it only accommodation services that will benefit from this reduction, and namely hotels? And of course, Mr. Speaker, the member from Catherine is asked, how does it work with all inclusives? Hotels are advertising packages overseas, and you buy a seven-day package to go to St. Lucia, which includes accommodation, flights, food and beverage. Is there a formula that is being used by the Inland Revenue, or whichever agency is responsible, that allocates what percentage? Again, maybe someone can explain. Is it 40%? is accommodation, 25% tours, 35% food and beverages. And again, those answers may be very simple answers and probably it ought just to be explained. It's not my job necessarily to explain it. St. Lucians are listening to Parliament and the, the hearing of a resolution that introduces a new VAT rate for accommodation. Can somebody explain to them how it works? This is a people's business, uh, and I think the presentation of it, Mr. Speaker, should account for those explanations so people can properly understand. Mr. Speaker, if you look at 1B3, I'm, I myself have to try to understand what it means. Tours conducted by land, air, or sea within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator, as part of the tour package, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by a tour operator. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? Can somebody just explain what does that mean to the ordinary person? So when he reads that his government is applying VAT and it applies to the indirect supply of transportation by a tour operator through a tour package, but not the direct, what does it mean? And, and I think we have real challenges, Mr. Speaker. But my real comment I, I want to make is, Mr. Speaker, a simple one. Where is the relief for hospitality workers? And again, it comes back to the first point I made. What is this designed to achieve? Is it to bring relief to the hotels? Is that what it is about? And if we are talking about relief to the hotels, because I also heard the member of Miku South says it's revenue neutral, so it is apparently not designed to achieve any more revenue for the state. Then, Mr. Speaker, can somebody tell me, and I've never in this House, since this COVID crisis started, ever heard the member for Ancillary Canaries, or even the member for Miku South, the Prime Minister, speak about relief for hospitality workers. Yes, under the NIC income relief package, they would have benefited. But all of us in here know of at least one person who would have lost their job 
from a hotel during this COVID crisis. And we all know that the NIC relief package ended at the end of September. And Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. No one addressed the nation at the termination or the ending of the NIC relief package and tell workers what will be in store for them in the uncertain months to come. There was no address to the nation, no mention of hotel hospitality workers and of workers generally. And Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. People are getting frustrated. Uncertainty is rising. Depression is settling in for some people. And the hospitality workers, more than anybody else in this country, suffered from COVID. So many of them, and we heard the reports, we hear all the statements of how many new flights are coming to St. Lucia. More flights and more flights and more tourism arrivals. But you don't hear how many workers were made redundant in hotels in the south, the hotels in the north. You don't hear any official statement. You don't hear anything about what is going to be done for those workers. And some of the same hotels that I'm hearing that are making workers redundant, they're advertising positions. Some of them are even advertising positions overseas right now. And let's not pretend that it is not true. Let's not pretend that it is not true. They are advertising positions, the same hotel that are making workers redundant. And you will all agree in this honorable chamber that even before COVID, the hospitality workers suffered some of the worst terms and conditions of employment the split shift, the long hours. We're not making a statement whether it's needed or not. It's just a statement of fact of what is. Think of the social impact on the split shift, on small children, on the long working hours. Again, let's not be normative and decide whether it's, it, it can be different or it should be different. It is what it is. Commissions being paid at hotels, Tips and service charge, how are they shared? Our hotel hospitality sector is the most unrepresented sector of workers in St. Lucia. Don't take it too far, Honorable Member. I beg your pardon? Don't take the debate too far off the VAT. Well, I'm making a case for VAT for workers. Oh, and VAT really for workers. Tied, tied to it. Don't take it. Well, I'm tying it. I'm going to tie it. Is, if, they can, if there can be VAT relief for workers, maybe we should have VAT relief for, for workers too. Because the workers have suffered. And I'm asking a simple question. Commensurate with this relief, can we get some for workers? And maybe the time will come when we have to link incentives and concessions to the terms and conditions of workers in, in, in hotels. Maybe we should be doing so. So, Mr. Speaker, I will not argue with the Minister of Finance. I'll wait for the tourism levy bill when we will discuss in greater detail the hospitality sector. But from my vantage point, I think it is grossly unfair that we come again to the House to talk about relief and incentives to hotels, which may be very well in place and needed, but the workers who have suffered the most from COVID, you do not hear anything about what has been granted to them what has been given to them. And I think, Mr. Speaker, and I hope and I ask members opposite to at least make a statement to the workers of this country as to what relief will be in place for them as we approach the Christmas season. From the end of September, monies have stopped being paid. What's going to happen to them? How are they going to survive the Christmas season? Hoteliers already know that they get in VAT relief as they are preparing to open up with all more flights coming in. We came to this chamber to give them relief. Can the workers get some relief, please? Thank you very much. Member for Ancillary.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my fullest support to the motion put forward by the member from Mikud South and the Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, it has to be made clear that we are not giving hotels a relief. Mr. Speaker, what we're doing, we are trying to balance the scale. Because, Mr. Speaker, this House would note that over the past two years or so, we have come to this House and we have implemented several revenue measures, Mr. Speaker, on the hospitality sector. So, for example, Mr. Speaker, when you think of the airport development charge, which is 35 US dollars per passenger, Mr. Speaker, we also had an increase in the airport uh, departure tax by from 25 to by 38 dollars it went from 35 to 63 dollars mr speaker having noted that there were significant increases on tourists that are coming to the island albeit on the aviation side or on the ticketing side we then realized mr speaker that in order to impose another marketing levy or a head tax and we will have that bill uh, later on in the standing orders what that will do mr speaker it will within a short space of time bring about significant increases mr speaker on the tourism sector and so mr speaker in consideration for the competitiveness of the sector what we are simply trying to do is in an effort to give the St. Lucia Tourism Authority, more dynamism, more budgetary flexibility. What we're trying to do is to empower the St. Lucia Tourism Authority to be able to have its own marketing fund. And so, Mr. Speaker, there are legislative changes that need to happen to make that take place. And so, the members, the members that have spoken know fully well, because the tourism levy bill it's not a new bill to this house and it's coming in the order paper later on and they know specifically and they would have read the contents of the house today to see on the order paper that we're proposing to have a marketing fee for the tourism authority the prime minister and the miku the member for miku south made that clear in his presentation that what we are doing is more or less trying to give the the this here Two, there are two entrants here on the balance sheet. One is increasing the tax on one side to give greater marketing support to the tourism authority. Mr. Speaker, several tourism authorities have already implemented uh, this measure. And Mr. Speaker, we're somewhat behind. So the dynamism, the flexibility, and to be able to compete in the very fluid and dynamic marketing uh, space would become extremely difficult if this measure is not taken. But more on that later. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a necessary measure in order to reduce the operating cost within the industry. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, what we are proposing here is a measure, Mr. Speaker, that is revenue neutral. Mr. Speaker, I heard the member for Castries East said, that small hotels are not included. Mr. Speaker, this is not correct. We are talking about accommodation and small hotels fall under the accommodation. And so, Mr. Speaker, unless he defines small hotels as something else, but once you're making over $400,000, which most small hotels, in terms of their revenue, they would be VAT registered. And so, Mr. Speaker, they are going to benefit from the uh, measure that we're putting in place here, the VAT reduction. Mr. Speaker, it was also said by the leader of the opposition, who was noticeably very brief, because to me he had nothing to say. The VAT reduction, Mr. Speaker, where it, he said that it is not going to be on restaurants, the head tax is not applied to restaurants and tourist suppliers. And so therefore, Mr. Speaker, there's no need 
to reduce the VAT rate on tours and on restaurants because the head tax, the tourism levy is clearly going on people staying on accommodation. So, Mr. Speaker, it could have been called an accommodation tax because this is exactly what it is. It is going on people that are staying in hotel rooms. So the restaurants are not impacted, so no need for us to go to give them uh, that measure. The member for Castro South, who spoke a little longer but said nothing, Mr. Speaker, went on to say that we should have had this measure, uh, across, that VAT should be across the board, and there should not be this tier system. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to put to him today that he's, a, he's many years late. When VAT was implemented in 2013, Mr. Speaker, you would recall that the population faced a 15% VAT rate. I heard nothing from the member for Castri South then, Mr. Speaker, about the 8% rate which the industry enjoyed. And so, Mr. Speaker, this is the consistent duplicity of the opposition where they do one thing when they're in government and when they're in opposition, they turn around and do something else. Mr. Speaker, and so therefore, what we are doing here is a simple measure. There are two sides. There's a double transaction in the balance sheet. We have increased the head tax. It's no doubt going to have a significant increase in the way that uh, the hotel sector would do business and the cost of affording those vacations. And so therefore, what we're doing is making a reduction on the input side of VAT for the hotel sector. Mr. Speaker, the member for Castri South also sought clarification to ask whether we were giving a, a in his word, a, a, a break to hotels. Mr. Speaker, this question is disingenuous. Disingenuous because it is clearly showing, look at the order paper. I'm sure members would have had to prepare today. And there is a tax that's coming later on in the order paper in the tourism levy bill. And so when you have these kinds of questions, what, what it serves to do, Mr. Speaker, is only mislead the unsuspecting public. Mr. Speaker, he also brought up the member for Castri South what formula is used to measure the all-inclusive sector. This would be a very difficult number, Mr. Speaker, because all-inclusive sectors vary in the services that they provide. Some all-inclusives provide butler service, some don't. Some all-inclusives have very few restaurants. And so it is very difficult to calculate what percentage of the, of the vacation goes to accommodation and what goes to the other services. And so that will vary because you have, Mr. Speaker, different properties applying a different ratio in terms of the cost. And it is, it is very difficult to spread it out. And so what we have done, Mr. Speaker, is to use a very simplified approach to be able to go, Mr. Speaker, and use a figure that will not disadvantage most individuals. We have had consultation, Mr. Speaker, with the sector far and wide. And in those consultations, Mr. Speaker, I think that what we have said is that the, the rate at which we are proposing the tax, Mr. Speaker, two bands, uh, if you're below an ADR of $120, Mr. Speaker, it's going to be at $3. If you're above an ADR of $120, it's going to be Honorable at $6. Member, yes. We're not starting debate on the other so, the motions now. And so, and so, Mr. Speaker, it is very difficult for us to come up with what percentage because it varies in different hotels. Where is the relief for hospitality workers, asked the member for Castri South. Mr. Speaker, I am very happy to report that the NIC has made it clear that they have handled over 18,000 applications, Mr. Speaker, in the Government Income Support Program where it went to several vendors and uh, a lot of uh, people in the hospitality industry, taxi drivers, who are all self-employed individuals, albeit that they were not, Mr. Speaker, registered with the NIC, those individuals, Mr. Speaker, got significant relief from the government. There were over 6,000.
thousand individuals who received that support. Now, when we came to uh, debate the bill, Mr. Speaker, this government was hauled over the coals by the opposition. They said we should not have touched the NIC funds, that we are, we are going to significantly uh, impair the NIC funds, Mr. Speaker. But today, the member for Castries South has the audacity to ask, what are we going to do when the NIC fund mechanism expires beyond September? Mr. Speaker, we have made that clear. What we are doing is we are fast-tracking the recovery of the economy. The Prime Minister and several other ministers have stated that we're using the construction industry to propel and to give a, bring about some level of relief. Coupled with that, Mr. Speaker, we're also uh, looking at fast-tracking the opening of the tourism industry, and we are seeing significant gains. We are about 30%, Mr. Speaker, of where we were pre-COVID. And so, Mr. Speaker, we're seeing just last Sunday, we had seven flights landed at Uranora, one of the largest amount of flights we've had since uh, the reopening of our borders in July 9th. And so, Mr. Speaker, despite the increases we've seen in cases, despite the uh, shutdown in the UK, we see, Mr. Speaker, that 80% of our hotel rooms remain open. We see, Mr. Speaker, that 5,000 out of the 15,000 of those employees have returned to work. We see, Mr. Speaker, that many small businesses have reopened. We see, Mr. Speaker, that over 300 taxi drivers have begun their trade. And thousands, hundreds more, sorry, Mr. Speaker, are being considered and are inspected to go into operation. And so, Mr. Speaker, if we continue at this pace, and, and if the world can get their a handle on COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, we're very confident that come next summer that we would be in a significant position to be able to rebound tourism, rebound the economy, and as well provide much needed uh, economic opportunity for other sectors linking to tourism. Mr. Speaker, hotel redundancy. It was said by the member for Castries South, and again misleading the public on several hotels making their staff redundant. But let us look at the context. Mr. Speaker, there are a few hotels that have made their employees redundant. And the Minister for Labor is right here. He brought a bill uh, where we went and we tried to extend the uh, period at which the redundancy could be extended to allow hotels and their staff to have a more flexibility within uh, the period of COVID. And so, Mr. Speaker, we increased it to six months. But, Mr. Speaker, some of the unions went to a couple of the hotels to say that let us negotiate and it, we are better off having our staff redundant rather than having them laid off. Because, Mr. Speaker, with the lay, layoff protocol, the employees didn't get any monies. And so I know in two instances where the redundancy was triggered not by the institution or the investor, but was triggered instead by the trade union who felt that their members would have been in a better position so that that can happen. So I just want to clarify the context about the redundancies that we have seen by some of the hotels. Mr. Speaker, it is also um, noteworthy. It was asked here today, where is the relief for VAT? Where is the relief of VAT for workers? Mr. Speaker, we came in this house and we argued that the VAT rate of 15% instituted by the St. Lucia Labour Party administration was too oppressive. It was too onerous on the backs of the working people of this country. And the member for Castries South, when we said that this was relief to workers, people that were going to the supermarkets, people that were shopping, he then opened his mouth in criticism to that very action, in trying to reduce the VAT rate from 15 to 12.5 percentage points. 
He then suggested, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to bankrupt the country. He preferred, Mr. Speaker, a tax rate instead at 15% VAT. And today, Mr. Speaker, he's asking, where is the VAT relief for workers? You know what I described it as? That is simple politics at the cheapest order. And Mr. Speaker, what we see is a consistent trend from the member who has a problem in leveling with the people of St. Lucia, who has a problem in leveling with this honorable house and goes down, Mr. Speaker, on many occasions as misleading the house. And so, Mr. Speaker, there's nothing here to, to question. This is a very straightforward transaction. Very, very straightforward motion brought forward by the Prime Minister. And so, Mr. Speaker, in closing, I want to remind the member for Castries South and also the, the House through you that it was not so long ago that the Minister for Finance also came to this House and sought the permission of the House to borrow uh, monies from the European Union Bank in order, Mr. Speaker, to bring relief to small businesses. A lot of those small businesses are the working people of this country. A lot of them that will benefit are people who are self-employed, are people, Mr. Speaker, who go and they toil every day, bringing about an income for themselves. And so, Mr. Speaker, I, I think that uh, I have spent my time here uh, answering and trying to clarify a lot of the disingenuous questions that were asked from the other side. And I say, Mr. Speaker, in closing, that I give this motion my fullest support. I thank you. Member for Castries Office. Mr. Speaker, as I stand to join my voice to this discussion today, I would ask leave of you to extend condolences to Independent Senator Mauricia Thomas on her loss. Also, <clears throat> I would seek your permission, Mr. Speaker, to extend condolences um, to the Adventist community and more so to the family and friends of Pastor Cornelius Emmanuel um, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, who passed away this morning. Um, he happened to be the pastor for the church that I attend in Forest, yeah? And also he pastors um, the Northeastern District made up of the churches of Bocage, Babono, Tiroche Geno, and Forest. Yeah. So I take this opportunity to extend our condolences to everyone involved or who knew him. And I know his neighbor to our colleague, my colleague minister, member for Mikud North. Mr. Speaker, we come to the business of the day. And we have a simple resolution before the House, which is going to be further supported by additional amendments that would be made to certain pieces of legislation as we go further. Um, but things are taken in strides, and one step at a time, you seek to address 
the matters. And you would expect that as parliamentarians who have a whole, the whole picture would take into consideration the material that is before us, the material that is provided in advance that they could look at and they could make the necessary deductions that are required so that the contribution made to this honorable house can be something that goes down in the record as factual and something that is at least thought provoking. And we have the, the two members who spoke on the bill from the opposition seem to be at odds with each other, uh, Mr. Speaker, because in fairness to the member for Castries East, the member said that these were small steps that we were taking. He, he did not find that we were going far enough to help the sector in this scenario, but his colleague, the member for Castries South, as usual, goes on a different tangent altogether. And it just reminds me by way of passing. One member said we are world class. Another one said we are the worst prepared. Today we come to the Parliament of St. Lucia again. A bill. A bill that both parties had to have gone through it and understood. And here we are. The member for Castries is highlights that the industry needs some assistance given the challenges posed by COVID-19 and says that what we are doing there, he describes it in his exact words, these are small steps. But you know, in these difficult times, Mr. Speaker, I am happy that I belong to a government that can take small steps at this point in time in the midst of all that is happening to help every sector of the economy to see some sign of recovery. You see, Mr. Speaker, when we come to this house, it's easy when you sit on the opposition side to say what you want, how you want, when you want. But it is when you have the reins of control, when, when you have to be the one to make the decision, and you have only one chance to make the decision, and if you get it wrong, it is costly. And that is why they're sitting over there, Mr. Speaker. Because every time they've made decisions, they've gotten it wrong. So let's look at what is before us. Under the SLP administration, we hear about one hotel will benefit more than the other. Mr. Speaker, it was the same members sitting on the opposite side who passed some incentive regime for the hotel sector where if you are spending $5 million, you got a certain percentage of the duties, if you are spending 20 million, and then when you got to spending 100 million, which is what the largest hotels would spend, you would get 100%. So they did not see at that time that that was discrimination, and then that was creating an uneven playing surface for the players in the industry. But you see, conveniently, when they sit in opposition, Mr. Speaker, they want to make people believe that they support what is good for the people. But when they are in charge, they make the worst decision. And the record is there to show you know. These are not my words. When this bill was debated in the House, I sat on the opposition side and I said, I challenge it and you can go to Hansard, you will find it there. I said, look here. The method that is being used. So you are telling me that all of us have to buy a pound of rice for the same price. But if I can only spend $5 million to renovate or upgrade my hotel, then 
the person who spends 50 million will get 75% of but the person who spends 5 million can only get 50% of how does that work and then the hotels that would spend 100 million now I'm not saying that they did not have the right to do it this way but when you are in government if you did it in a particular way that suited you do not come and criticize when what we are doing is even better and more accommodating than what you did when you were in government. This is disingenuous on the part of the members opposite. And that's why they cannot agree. They speak at odds with each other. One support and one against. Mr. Speaker, they raised another matter about the VAT. And what we are dealing with here is a reduction in the VAT, which is supposed to be revenue neutral, which the PM, the member for Castri, for Mikud South, explained that in the process, there may be times when they may be better off, but there may be times when they are worse off. But you expect at the end of the day, it would be balanced. And it would not be too much in favor of them and against the government or too much in favor of the government and against the, the sector. So it is the approach that is being taken. And at least you would expect that members on the verge or with an election approaching, you would expect them to come and be genuine and honest with the people of St. Lucia, at least in presenting basic information. So the member for Castro South again went down the road. And I keep on telling him, when you are late in the game, learn before you speak. You just came to the house the other day. Go back and read all the Hansard and try to understand what the party you belong to did when they were in government. And then you can speak from an informed position. But you continue to say things because you just come. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, here's what he said. How many VAT rates? I thought VAT was supposed to be the whole idea of the value added tax was supposed to be one standard rate across the board. When his government introduced VAT, there were three rates. The 15%, the 10%, and the 0%. But he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that, Mr. Speaker. So he comes to the house and he would grandstand himself. I don't know what happened to these PhD people. <laughs> they just feel that they have some knowledge that is not available to other people. <laughs> My wife is a PhD, so I can speak about that. No order, Mr. Speaker. Can you inform the honourable member that I was never part of the last Liberal Party government? He says my government did this. So can you please tell him to, to guide the house properly? But go on, honourable member. Honourable member, you saw <laughs> hmm? the government of the St. Lucia Liberal Party at the time. He was not. I, I said that, Mr. Speaker. I said he just came. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, he did hear that. I I said you just came, so go back and read the. <laughs> go back and read the hands. Honorable part. members, let's not start. <laughs> Honorable <laughs> members. <laughs> Honorable <laughs> member. B Mr. Speaker, you know I choose my words carefully when I'm in the house, and I think that. I will come to the explanation and I can understand why the member cannot understand certain things because he said he could not understand and I will come to it. But Mr. Speaker, I chose my words very carefully. I said what the government that he is a part of did when they were there before. And I said that go and read the Hansard so you can acquaint yourself with what happened before. 
So when you come and speak today, you will speak from an informed position. Is that not clear enough, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> Do I have to say that in Patua? I mean, how else can I say that for the member for Castro South to understand what I am saying? Mr. Speaker, their intellect is full in them. And so, he does not understand what we are saying here. And I don't expect he will ever understand. But let me move on, Mr. Speaker. So, I was making the point about the VAT rates and the different rates which was introduced by the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party. And I said again, Mr. Speaker, I was in opposition and I spoke on it. And you know what I was told by the then leader, the member for Viewfort South, who I don't see here today? His response was, whatever happens with that, I will take responsibility for it. And it's in Hansard. And I told him half of the small businesses in St. Lucia would close. Mr. Speaker, this government, and the member for Castries is said, Oh, he's anxiously waiting to see when this government is going to eliminate VAT. Because, Mr. Speaker, I keep on saying, they have a lot of confidence in us, you know. <laughs> you see the members opposite there? Don't mind what they say in the House. They have the confidence that the only government who can reduce taxes on the people of St. Lucia is the government on this side of the House. And we have proven it. Mr. Speaker, when we came and we reduced the VAT from 15% to 12.5%, we were told that we are giving away $54 million or thereabout. Today, the member for Castro South, Mr. Speaker, comes to the House and says to us, well, so where's the VAT break? for the poor people or the workers of this country. You know what the member for Castries is did? He came and he calculated on a bill of about $300 or something. I, I cannot remember the exact number. But he said that the savings would be about $37 that the VAT savings and was asking what would that do for somebody but that was the same member who a few weeks before said five dollars can block a hole <laughs> and how many times can five go into 37 <laughs> you see mr speaker members opposite a lot of them are not genuine in the information that they are giving us and so the members went on mr speaker the member for Castro South opposed his leader on the bill while his, mem while his leader called it small steps he feels we should not do it. The member could not understand the transportation issues of land, sea and air. The bill says now, you have to be Honor, in the... Honor, remember, just, you keep using the word bill. Uh, motion. Motion. The motion, Mr. Speaker. Tours conducted by land, air, or sea within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of the tour package, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by the tour operator. Now, Mr. Speaker, when you take the package, and you take, because this has to do with the accommodation, how you go, there are certain things you can tax, and no matter how much you want to tax, there are certain things you will never be able to fully get to the point of being able to tax. But here's the point I wanted to make on this. The member 
I don't think he understands the tourism sector and how it operates. I have limited understanding of this sector. But I trust the people who have been entrusted with that responsibility to do the work and to come up. So the Ministry of Finance, the Attorney General's Office, the Hotel and Tourism Association, the Minister of Tourism, everybody came together and looked at how do you play the balancing act with this so that the financing of the tourism authority can be done in a seamless manner and that the bulk of the funds can go directly to the marketing of St. Lucia. And I heard the member for Castries. Is, you know what his response was? Well, the, the geniuses on this side, I'm paraphrasing, um, who seem to know everything about tourism, think that by 2023, the industry will be back. Mr. Speaker, we have confidence on this side of the house that even before 2023, the industry will be back. You see, Mr. Speaker, the performance of the economy, and the member for Ancillary Canary said it, for a sector that hired or employed about 15,000 persons, about 5,000 persons are back at work, Mr. Speaker. Now, I don't expect the members opposite to understand this, but you know what that means for these 5,000 families. Even if they are working reduced hours and getting reduced earnings, how much that means to them. You know how many of these people are happy that they now have a job that they can go back to and that they can see where the next meal for their family is coming from? But here's what the member for Castries South says. And I want to ask him, when they pass the labor code, when the labor party came with that, because here's what he said, who is representing the workers? What is being done with that for the workers? So I want to ask him. And then he says we should tie the incentive. That's what he says. We should get to the point of tying incentives to the conditions of work and employment. So why did we pass a labor code? Wasn't the labor code designed to take care of the needs and the demands and the conditions of work for the workers in this country? So are you admitting today, through you Mr. Speaker, is the Labour Party admitting that they failed the people of St. Lucia when they rushed through with a Labour Code that does not meet the needs of the workers in this country? That is the question they need to answer. You see, Mr. Speaker, you cannot come and use basic legislation, basic adjustments to things that would benefit the economy to make, to try and score political points while making a fool out of yourself, Mr. Speaker. You cannot do that. There are some things that just don't add up. So the labor code is what is to govern the method, the conditions of employment in this country. Not incentives. But if he wants to talk about incentives, I have news for him. I want him to bring, he always has documents. Bring the range agreement that I believe the, the member for Castries South has spoken several times as if he is, and note my words, Mr. Speaker, as if he was the representative for range in this honorable house. And I can tell you, there is a section in that same range agreement. Now, Mr. Speaker, 10.2 job vacancies in the agreement. And if he wants me to make it a document of the house, I can. I just have to print it. On this 10.2 A and B, you know what was agreed to by the Labour Party administration? That 40% of the workers 
could be foreign workers. But today, he, not for the construction, for the operational side of the hotel, which includes from bartenders, room attendants, upper management, I guess even security if you want. You see, Mr. Speaker, you cannot say one thing when you're on one side and when it's convenient, you say something else. What that makes you, Mr. Speaker, you do not allow me to use that language in the House. So I cannot impute improper motive to a member. Honorable member, just yes. a general warning that I gave previously. Just remember, I know you give an explanation to some questions asked, but always Yes, remember. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the VAT well, introduction. Saying, um, Can I ask that a copy of this agreement? I've never seen it in my life be made available. <laughs> I would love to. No, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members. <laughs> Honorable members. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker, if a minister is quoting from an official document, he has a responsibility to make it available to the House. The member is quoting specific sections from an agreement. Can the document be made a document of the House? So I said I, I, I can't make it a document. So please do, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member, you said if it is so required, then it can well, be, I am asking it can be printed required. and so made Can you document. make copies, Mr. Speaker, please? Yes. So, so you see, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I was tying this whole work permit arrangement with what the member said about caring for the workers in the industry while reducing the VAT for the hotel sector, what is in it for the workers. And I was just drawing a parallel, Mr. Speaker, drawing an illustration to show the inconsistencies of members opposite to tell me that you would go into an agreement and I, when I say you I don't mean him personally but the government that was the sitting government of the day the Labour Party government who sold the land for rent six days before the elections at a very reduced price and further agreed Father agreed to about 40% of the workers. And it's specific in the agreement, you know. Not for pertaining to the construction side, but to the operational side. Now, Mr. Speaker, would I say I have a problem with that? Yes, I would have a problem with that. But I also understand. That when people come to invest their money, there are certain conditions that they would put on the table where the government of the day have to decide, do I want the investment and profit from the 60% employment or do I reject the, the project and benefit from nothing? These are decisions that the government must make. But when you make the decision, don't come back and try and turn around and make it look like somebody is doing something that is wrong when you did worse. You see, that's my problem with the members opposite. And so, Mr. Speaker, what should be simple? You want to, you are requesting that you link incentives to conditions of workers. So I guess each person will have a different set of working conditions based on the incentives that they have received. Now, if you do that, do you need a labor code anymore? Because the hotel industry, government workers are not covered under the labor code. So if you take the largest industry in St. Lucia, which is the tourism sector, and you put your own rules to govern these workers, do we have to repeal the labor code then? Is that what the member for Castries South is asking directly or indirectly that we re re repeal the labor code because it's not meeting its requirements? So, Mr. Speaker, this reduction is designed to 
to be revenue neutral. So when I hear both the member for Castries East and Castries South talking about, oh, um, you know, who's going to benefit from this? Are you, are you creating an unbalance, an imbalance in the process, in the sector where small operators will not benefit and large operators will benefit? You see, Mr. Speaker, there's some, you don't, necessarily say it or quantify it. But without the large operators, the small operators would almost be non-existent. So think of it. If you remove all the large hotels in St. Lucia, how many flights will we have come into St. Lucia? What will be the cost of a ticket to come to St. Lucia if you have such low rates of person? So while, while the large hotels benefit, they spend more. They market St. Lucia. They do a lot of things that benefits the industry. But I don't expect the members opposite to understand the nitty gritty of how the economy works because they've done a lousy job over the years in managing the economy. So, you have to know and, and let me use an illustration to, say, to make my point. When bananas was green gold, Every other sector of agriculture did better. The citrus fruits, the coconuts, everything. Because you had a cash crop. You had a main crop that brought in the money and then it helped sustain the other sectors of agriculture. So the same person who had a banana farm along the banks would plant some coconut trees or some mango trees. In between the farm in the hilly area, they would plant citrus like orange and autinic and tangerine and all of these things, limes and lemons. I was a farmer. And I understand that. But you see, you need a cash crop to keep these other crops going because nobody will go in the, in the, um, on the farm and care for an orange tree. But while they were caring for the banana plantation, they cared for the orange trees. That is how industries work. One depends on the other. So for the small properties, the Airbnb, the two rooms, the six rooms, the guest houses, the more tourism activity you have on the island, the more popular the destination becomes, and the more business these people get. So of course you, it would appear on paper that if you look at it just on the surface, that one benefits more than the other, but one needs the other in order to survive. The, the smaller part of the industry needs the larger operators to keep them viable. Can you imagine operating the Sulphur Springs with just the people who stay in at Airbnb and all the tours and everything that we have there? What money would they make? You see, Mr. Speaker, I want members opposite to understand. There are vital lessons to be learned when you pay attention to why decisions are made and stop seeing things just from a political lens. And so, Mr. Speaker, I give my full support to this motion because this motion, as the member for Castries is said, is a small step to help the industry at a time, if there was a time that they needed a break, it is now. And I believe that, we, that more can be done or should be done to help that industry just stay alive. Because you see these 5,000 people who are at work now, Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility and that is why our approach to COVID 19 and the protocols and everything is so important because if we do not bring it under control it means that these 5,000 workers may eventually have to go back home and that is why this government is taking some measures that may not be very accommodating that people may not agree with us and it is clearly evident 
from where I stand here that the members opposite have not been in support of the measures being undertaken by this government for the control of the pandemic. The actions have shown otherwise. But Mr. Speaker, action speaks louder than words. And I want them to understand that the actions of this government is a clear indication that we understand the needs of the time and that we are the best place government to manage and govern in this time that we are. And so, Mr. Speaker, when we bring simple pieces of legislation that members opposite can see the merits of it, but for politics, we'll try to oppose and poke holes in what is good for the industry to not just keep the 5,000 people at work, but to try and get the industry to absorb at least another 5,000. So that by early next year, we can have the majority of workers back at work in this country. That is our aim. And I believe the legislation that we are presenting today, the amendments, the changes, the motions, and the bills, will all help the country in achieving this goal. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Laver. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think now we cook in the gas, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I indicated a few moments ago, I want to add my voice to this very important discourse in this house. And I recall some time ago, the motion was introduced together with the value added tax, and of course, the motion to vary the VAT to accommodate the tourism sector, together with the tourism levy bill and the St. Lucia Tourism Amendment Bill. The government at the time claimed that it had to review certain aspects of the legislation, which according to the government could give rise to misinterpretation. All of these matters have been placed on the agenda today, Mr. Speaker. This is because these matters are all linked in a very special way. More specifically, Mr. Speaker, the reduction in the value added tax is linked to the implementation of the tourism levy. In the Prime Minister's opening remarks, 
and in presenting this motion to the parliament, did indicate that he's trying to establish a revenue stream for the tourism authority. The resolution to reduce the value added from 10% to 7% will, of course, in my soundness of judgment, result in a reduction in revenue. It would be important, Mr. Speaker, for Parliament to know the quantum of revenue that would be lost as a result of the reduction in the value added tax proposed in this resolution. We would then need to know how much revenue will be collected by way of the tourism levy, which is proposed, according to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Tourism, at $3 for accommodation at or below US $120 and $6 for accommodation above US $120. The levy is proposed to be collected by the St. Lucia Tourism Authority, which is part of the Minister for Finance plan to create dedicated revenue streams. I will have more to say about the practice of AMAC in revenues a little later, Mr. Speaker. The Minister for Finance needs to clarify whether the two proposals, namely the reduction in the value added tax and the tourism levy, is revenue enhancing or, as he indicated or adumbrated, revenue neutral or would yield a reduction in revenue. Clearly, under rational for this particular approach. I will also examine the distributional consequences of this policy namely which hotels benefit from this policy. I will also spend some time, Mr. Speaker, on examining efficacy of the ad valorem tax, which is percentage tax like the value added tax, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific tax, which is a dollar amount like what proposed for the tourism levy, according to the Prime Minister. I will examine first the case for an ad valorem tax as in the case of the value added tax, compared to the specific tax as in the case of the tourism levy. In the case of the value added tax, the tax is levied on the cost of the goods and services. As the price of the good or service increases, the tax increases. For example, if the price of a good increases from $100 to $120, if the tax is 10%, the tax increases from $10 to $12. This is the experience we all face when the price of goods rises in the supermarket. In the case of the specific tax, the tax does not increase when the value increases. It only increases when the number of bed nights increases as the tax is a dollar amount on bed nights. If the hotel increases its accommodation rate from US $200 per night to $240 US per night, the tax will remain at $6 US per night. In the case of the value added tax, the tax would have increased assuming a current rate of 10% from US $20 to US $24, a four US dollar increase. It is clear in the time of price increases, the ad valorem tax performs better for the government than the specific tax. In the language of the economists, we will say that the real value of the specific tax has fallen as it can buy fewer goods and services. The issue of a marking taxes, as the government proposes, Mr. Speaker, with the creation of a revenue stream with the tourism levy, is not recommended as best practice. Not recommended as best international practice. It is recommended that all revenue should go into a central pool, and then the government should prioritize how it should spend the revenues that is collected. The creation of a revenue stream for the tourism authority would be onerous on an economy which suffers a major external shock which impacts disproportionately the non-tourism sectors. The revenue contraction felt by these sectors would have to be borne by other sectors. 
as they would not be able to benefit from the revenue accruing from the tourism levy. Equally, if the tourism sector, Mr. Speaker, were to suffer disproportionately from an external shock, as in the case of COVID-19, then it would severely impact the tourism authority in terms of its marketing programs. This could be particularly troublesome if the tourism authority has incurred substantial commitments through marketing. The diminished revenue flows would severely affect its capacity to meet the repayment obligations. Mr. Speaker, to put it bluntly, I do not see why the Minister for Finance wishes to propose these changes, and there are no clear benefits in doing so, Mr. Speaker. If there is a dedicated fund for the Tourism Authority, there is an external shock, the Minister and others made their arrangements, have their commitments, how do we actually meet those commitments, Mr. Speaker? Finally, Mr. Speaker, I would like to address the issue of the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of those proposed new arrangements in the reduction in the value-added tax and the simultaneous implementation of the tourism levy. In order to examine these scenarios, Mr. Speaker, I will use some examples to illustrate my point. Firstly, I will look at hotels charging prices below US $120, in which the levy is US $3 per night. Let us look at a scenario for a hotel charging $100 per night. The reduction in the value added tax from 10% to 7% will result in the value added tax of US $3. At 10% VAT, as it is currently, it will increase $10. At the reduced rate of 7% VAT, the government would collect $7. The $3 reduction in VAT would be offset by the tourism levy of US $3. So there would be no net change in revenue for the government. The only difference is that the tourism levy would be collected by the tourism authority. If the hotel charges US $120 per night, the change in the VAT from 10% to 7% will result in, result in a reduction in the VAT by $3.60 US. With a tourism levy of US $3, Government overall stands to lose 60 cents per bed night. However, if a hotel were to charge 121 US dollars per bed night, the revenue loss from VAT would be US $3.63, while the tourism authority would collect 6 US dollars. It is clear that these hotels will now have to increase the tax inclusive rates to compensate for the higher tourism levy for rooms above 120 US. This would apply to all hotels which charge up to $200 per night. And we know, Mr. Speaker, that most of the tourists that come to St. Lucia, they are price sensitive passengers. These are the people who are in coach class. We have a very limited business class coming here. And we will examine those who come to business class how this particular arrangement is impacting them and the hotels. At US $200 per night, the impact of the reduction from 10% to 7% is US $6, which would then be recouped via the tourism levy of $6. So Mr. Speaker, hotels which charge from US $101 up to $199 will be required to increase most likely their rates. This could have implications for those hotels especially since they, they actually operate in a highly competitive price-sensitive market. The main beneficiaries of this new policy by this government are the hotels which charge very high room rates, Mr. Speaker. For example, a hotel which charges US $400 per night will see a reduction in the value-added tax from 10% to 7% of US $12. The tourism levy is, however, only $6, resulting in a reduction in revenue to government of US $6 per night. This situation is compounded for hotels which charge, say, $1,000 US per night. The reduction in VAT would be $40 US per night. The government is still only collecting $6, thus incurring a loss of US $24 per night. 
The guests who can afford to pay these high rates, Mr. Speaker, are not likely to be those who are price sensitive and likely to shift from hotel to the next in response to a small increase in price. This segment of the market, Mr. Speaker, tends to be price inelastic. So it is clear, Mr. Speaker, that this policy benefits the hotels which charge the highest rates, those that are price insensitive. And the majority of the hotels probably would, have a, would be impacted negatively. It is for this reason, Mr. Speaker, I have expressed concern about this approach at this juncture in time. Any motion to benefit hoteliers in this country, and that would, that would have a net benefit to the St. Lucian economy, I have no problems with it, Mr. Speaker. But one thing I will say, of course, it would also make tax collection very troublesome, very cumbersome. So now the hotels have to deal with inland revenue on one hand and having to deal with the tourism authority on the other hand. So when we are, when we are talking about an era where we're supposed to be moving into tax efficiency, we are being very inefficient if we should assume that posture, Mr. Speaker. And so I'm hoping that in summing up, the Prime Minister will clarify or illuminate further his strategy at this juncture in time for introducing that. I know he has been talking about that from the time he entered office, but I think he has introduced it in a very confusing way and in a very hasty way without in-depth analysis in my soundness of judgment. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, before I provide a rebuttal, so only this morning that I, when I heard the member from Castry Southeast mention about pastor, the passing of Pastor Emmanuel, it certainly would be remiss of me, considering that he is uh, born, bred, very proud um, representative of Miku South, in particular Deriso, and is also related to Mrs. Emmanuel, who is the chairperson of my, my branch. So, again, please let me extend my deepest sympathies to his family and certainly to the community who I know will feel a loss because he was a very loved um, person in our constituency. And I know I don't want to speak on her behalf and she certainly will speak. The minister from Cassidy Central, who is also um, a resident, a born resident from the constituency, I know that she will have probably her own words at the appropriate time to say. In uh, responding to some of the inputs that were given by the members on the opposite side, um, let me start first of all that the, this does not benefit small hotels and the ancillary facilities. Um, from a lot of people I would have accepted that, not understanding, but from a person who was a former Minister of Tourism and is an accountant by trade, I'm not so sure that this is really a complicated bill to have understood, to make a statement like that. This was intended and has always intended to be uh, a neutral tax. This is not intended to benefit one person versus the other. I indicated its imperfections and I'll deal with the member from Minister of, of Labry um, and his really very good presentation that he made. Um, the purpose of this is to benefit uh, the hoteliers and the country by putting in a funding mechanism for the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. That's what it's about. And I indicated, you know, when I was the Director of Tourism, I was the Minister of Tourism, the fight that we had, and I'm sure hopefully the member from Castries East in, in those positions as well, that the Ministry of Finance continuously gives the 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 
tourist board equal allocations. And, and we made famous the, the line called um, the hangover. After every budget year, there would be millions of dollars that were owed. And particularly of the timing of the St. Lucia Jazz Festival being May, which was the first event in the new budgetary year, we were starting off the year always in the hole. And the member was also the Minister of Infrastructure. So he would know that every time that we had to sign an agreement with an airline, the tourist board didn't have the capacity, the legal capacity to do so, because it's bound to only making expenditures within that fiscal year by being part of government. And so the Tourism Authority was continuously depending on the, the Air and Sea Ports Authority to sign um, the guarantees uh, in order to get the, the, the monies to sign an agreement. Because in the government financial system, it's only this house that has the authority to approve things. And we're only approving them in an appropriations bill for one year. When I came in as Minister of Tourism, um, the then Minister of Finance and I had lots of discussions, and I am now Minister of Finance, and I understand now the complications to resolve the issue because government has its own cash flow issues. And so the intention was to do similarly to what other countries have done around the world, is to allow the tourism authority to become an independent agency with its own revenue stream. And the member from Labrie brought up an interesting point. He was making the comparison between a percentage tax versus an absolute tax. The problem with percentage taxes in the hotel sector is the, the number that you're taxing is nebulous, meaning very difficult to get a fix on it. So when we had the HAT, Hotel uh, Accommodation Tax, and it was 8.5%, forever there was arguments between the Ministry of, of uh, Inland Revenue and the hoteliers. So the hoteliers would give you uh, different rates because they have a rate that's out in the marketplace and they said, no, that's not the rate we can pay the taxes on because we don't collect that money and we have to collect on what we have and so you have the, the hotel's net rate. To, to such an extent that both political sides ended up uh, reaching an accommodation where um, the all-inclusive hotels took um, their declared rate and discounted it by 30% um, to take into account all of the uh, extra activities that were included in their room rate. Because all inclusives includes your meals and everything else. So what we wanted to do was not make this a complicated tax for the tourism authority to collect. And so auditing becomes a critical component of this. And so when a hotel every Monday provides a manifest of the persons that they have in their hotel, very easy for the tourism authority personnel to go in and do an audit to make sure the number of people they say they have in the hotel, they have in the hotel. And they pay on a per head basis. And how do they get the increases? Exactly how the member from Lavery said, by as tourism arrivals increase, then they earn more money. But in terms of the negativity on government, remember government now has to allocate anywhere between 30 to 40 million dollars a year on funding the tourism authority, which comes out of our own cash flow. So the benefit of going to this is there is no longer going to be an allocation within government for that money. So in essence, the, the tourism authority is now has its own tax revenue stream, and yes, it comes at an expense because we are foregoing that three percent. And the hotels that are, are $120 are EP hotels. So if you have an all-inclusive rate, your rate is going to be upwards of $270 to $800, $1,000. And so again, it was to convince the hoteliers, because this is something we've attempted to do for four years. So it's not to say we just sprung it on the hotels. My first interaction with the hoteliers, we talked about this. And so therefore it was to find that balance. And it's impossible to find um, the perfect balance. But in the meanwhile, every day that we don't introduce this new method, 
then we don't have monies to be able to fund our tourism authority. We continue to have the cash flow problems. And therefore, St. Lucia is not benefiting from the branding experience that it should have. And during this COVID period, marketing is not, it's not a, a luxury, it's a necessity in building and investing in your brand. It's investing in your brand. So I, I want to say to the member from Labry, he did a really great job of analyzing it. Um, and I appreciate his input. Um, but yes, we did take into consideration the difference between an ad valorem tax, as you call it, and an absolute tax. And in this particular instance, because it's just much easier to count heads, we know exactly how much money we're supposed, they're supposed to collect. So exactly to avoid what you were saying in terms of making it overly complicated, and certainly in terms of analyzing what our number of arrivals are going to be every year, easier for them to estimate what that money is going to be um, versus a percentage. So in terms of the beneficiary, the beneficiary is the people of this country. How? Because by allowing us to have a stronger branding position helps not only with promoting tourism to generate jobs, to create linkages to all sectors of our economy, our culture and manufacturing, the orange economy, Every, every sector of this economy benefits from growth in tourism. But also, the exercise that I'm ecstatic about is leveraging that brand St. Lucia to bananas and to cocoa and to the other byproducts that we're producing here and creating a new portal to promote um, our products. So the more that St. Lucia is known and the more we can expose it in a targeted way, there is significant benefits. So let me help my good friend from Castries East. Our bananas are being promoted and are being sold in the UK market. We currently get around 80, 85,000 tourist arrivals a year. Where is it at the hotels that when they eat a banana, they see a logo on that banana, that they're buying a St. Lucia banana? Or if they have banana bread that we're promoting that this was made out of our own bananas? or if they're having banana coladas and banana daiquiris. You know, the experiences of other countries help us into educating ourselves so we don't make the same mistakes. How is it that, how is it that Corona beer became the number one selling beer in the world? <laughs> That's true. How did it become? 43 million U.S. tourists visit Mexico a year that get exposed to Corona beer. Tequila was the cheapest liquor that you could get. Now you have tequila factories selling for billions of dollars. Turkey has done an incredible job of linking its manufactured products with its brand. So it works. We would love when we get the p and uh, cruise line to come here, 150,000 British tourists would be coming here. If we can export our bananas, both as a fresh product and as an agro-processed product to Barbados, 250,000 British tourists that go there a year. And we know that if we want to see the purchasing of a brown 60,000 tons of bananas a year to the UK market. That's a half a million households in the UK consuming four bananas a week. That's where that, that's where that number comes from. And so is it possible? Well, every, every piece matters. So the, the goal here is to intertwine our tourism authority marketing with our products. So you will soon be seeing a significant campaign being launched here, which was well on the way before COVID, where the staff at the hotels will be promoting our bananas. That's a beautiful logo. We will be promoting the byproducts and the use of the hoteliers more of banana as an input into um, their, their food and drinks, as well as billboards, a, a website promoting our individual bananas uh, growers, so persons can go online from the UK and see who the farmers are? Yes, and in France too. But you see, the point is, is that, you know, members, members they asked, I was asked a question this morning, is what makes the difference between 
the United Workers' Party and the Labour Party. We have ambition and we have foresight. All they have is negativity. All they can do is talk, 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 but they can't deliver anything at the end of the day. And, and sadly, the facts are there to remain. We believe that we can get the production of bananas back up to 60,000 tons um, a year at minimum. And we are committed to doing members. that every single day. Honorable and we will Prime continue Minister. to put the farmers as one of the forefront of this country. And while members on the other side, Mr. Speaker, continue to try to say and create a divide between the farmers and the hotel sector, we will ignore those voices and we will continue to pursue what it benefits the people of this country because that is the voice that matters the most, not anybody else's voice. So, Mr. Speaker, as I move on, Honourable members, in terms of how we're going to solve the problem, members on the opposite side are right. We didn't come here to say that this new members. regime... We did not come to this House to say that we were going to put a regime in to benefit the hoteliers through this bill um, during COVID. We have done a lot of things to be able to benefit both the workers as well as the hoteliers. And one of the things that we will be doing is introducing tax concessions on inputs, particularly the inputs that um, are not produced in St. Lucia, for a six-month period. Because the hoteliers have taken on um, uh, the, the risk of reopening their hotels at this particular point. Look at that. All of a sudden, we had more airlift coming out of the UK, Mr. Speaker, post-COVID than we had pre-COVID. Imagine. We had seven daily flights with BA, and all of those flights were being shared with either Grenada or Trinidad. Now we have five dedicated flights from BA. We had one TUI flight before, now we were getting two TUI flights. We've increased the capacity out of the UK by over 50%. And all of a sudden, everybody was ready to go, hotels were reopening, planes were coming in, and sadly, Mr. Speaker, the UK government took a very tough decision, which was to close its borders. And not only to prevent British citizens from traveling abroad, but to prevent people from coming into the UK. And not only was it not travel abroad, but but British citizens are not even allowed to travel within the UK. Even if you have a secondary home in the UK, you're not allowed to go to that secondary home. And so it got shut down. And despite that, and some of the criticisms that I hear by members of the other side of the US, the US government has remained open for business and has allowed our hotel sector to reopen. And I'm very proud of the fact that Little St. Lucia, in its advocacy program to to get countries and airlines to support pre-testing that has worked. Both British Airways and American Airlines. American Airlines um, launched it into Hawaii. It was incredibly successful. British Airways launched it into um, Hong Kong. And we're going to now see St. Lucia, Grenada, and Belize now being included in the next phase um, of that program. And so despite COVID, we've seen with the right protocols, we can coexist. And we have done an incredible job. And I want to thank all the solutions and all the frontline workers and all the, the, the administrators and the technocrats and, and the hoteliers and all the people in the, the tourism sector for their in support to make this happen in believing that we could do this and we have done it. It's not by accident that 5,000 people were back at work. So when we asked the question, now that the uh, stimulus has ended, what is the solution? We called it from way back an economic recovery. An economic recovery that's being driven by tourism, by construction, and by the ICT sector, and by many programs that the government is putting on the table to give people income that they earn. And we've seen in the month of October, our revenues in government had recovered by 86%, way ahead of schedule. So, Mr. Speaker, we can see that the programs are working. Any solution can go around this country and see that the programs are working. Does that mean that there are not people who are affected? That does not mean that. Does that mean that we need to ignore those persons who have fallen through the crack? No. And we've said that. It just means we're not going to have policies that are macro in next stage. We're now going to have policies that are going to be specifically helping those people that are in need. So, Mr. Speaker, 
we are going to be doing things and are doing things to continue to prop up not only the big hoteliers, the small hoteliers, and the persons working in the industry. Mr. Speaker, we talk about tourism recovering by 2023. That's what, the, that's what the predictions are globally. But it doesn't mean that that's also going to apply to us. We believe because of the success of how we managed COVID, not only in St. Lucia in the region, that the Caribbean will probably recover much faster than the rest of the world can. Just on the news two days ago of there being a vaccine, stock prices in the airline industry, the cruise industry have buoyed. But we've not waited. We have airlines flying here. We have cruise ships coming back to the, to the destination. Are they making the same kind of impact that they had pre-COVID? No. But what they've shown is that the capacity to recover much quicker. And why is it that we had more airlift out of the UK post-COVID than we had pre-COVID? Because the demand was there. And one thing that British Airways had was planes. So if there was demand, they put the planes on. We are in an incredible situation in which the Caribbean can gain significant global market share, both out of Canada, United States, and the UK. And St. Lucia has already been witness to that, that we're way ahead. We're showing that we can coexist. We're open for business, and people are coming in. And we're doing it still trying to protect our citizens. And you know what's sad, Mr. Speaker? Is that instead of the members on the opposite side who say that they put people first, joining in and being champions of coexisting with COVID. I heard the leader of the opposition say that he joined me in saying that people should not be putting out fake news. And I applaud him for that. But 361 was not the solution to the problem. Because we believe in the freedom of speech. But responsibility of that freedom is critical. So what happened, Mr. Speaker? As the state of the emergency came to an end in this country, a group of persons who say that they put people first went out and had a march. Until that date, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia was being revered. 28 cases. Nobody had died. And is it to say, Mr. Speaker, that they did not have persons coming in through the back door? Uh, Mr. Speaker, is that to say? So immediately upon having the, the, the march, within 10 days, Mr. Speaker, we started seeing an increase in cases. Now, I'm not going to say for one moment, I'm not going to say for one moment that it's entirely their responsibility. But the fact is, that it's exactly what I've been saying. That we are here fighting for the lives of the average person in this country. Every single day. And what it requires us to do, Mr. Speaker, is the right thing. It is to do the right thing. And it is not to play cheap politics at the expense of everybody else and pretend that you're putting those people first when the only person you were trying to benefit is yourselves. Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, we have members on the opposite side when we have discussions about COVID, they walk out of the house. We have members on the other side who have been invited to the economic recovery who abandon their post. We have members on the opposite side, particularly the leader of the opposition, who gets paid the same salary as a minister in government. But when we have the NEMAC meeting, he cannot show up. No, he cannot show up, Mr. Speaker. You know what he does instead, Mr. Speaker? He sends a person who is not even a parliamentarian. Honorable members. Honorable members. Honorable members. Honorable member Kostris. Honorable. So, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members. Honorable members. Bring down the temperature. So, Mr. Speaker, Continue. we have NEMAC, which is an official government agency. NEMAC was created to deal with disasters and includes all of civil society 
and all of the, uh, the, the governments of off, uh, government offices of government. And the person who is supposed to attend is the leader of the opposition. But he doesn't want, but instead, who does he send? He sends a person who's not even a parliamentarian, has no, not even recognized, but out of the virtue of being cooperative, we let him come into the meeting. But Mr. Speaker, you cannot speak on both sides of your mouth. This situation requires all of us to be speaking from the same hymn book. Let us put the people of this country first. Let us not play divisive uh, politics, Mr. Speaker. And the evidence is there. What was the purpose of the march, Mr. Speaker? What did we achieve? No. Instead, instead of the members on the other side showing leadership and saying, yes, we wanted to have a, a march, but we think in this particular time we're not going to take that chance. They couldn't wait, Mr. Speaker. So while one may not be able to directly link anything, one cannot also say they did not contribute. It was irresponsible. And that is the change that we need in this country. What the people of this country need is leadership. That's what they need. And leadership that is dedicated to the benefit of the people of this country, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to continue. Honorable members. Honorable member. Mr. Speaker, a member from Castry South. Honourable member. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. Yes. I would just like to reiterate that the Prime Minister is speaking the truth to the nation of the nation. Okay. So, Mr. Speaker, the member from Castry South brought up a very interesting discussion. And it's one that we've been having um, both at Castry South and Castry East with regards to VAT. And the government's indication that the first step was to reduce VAT, which we did, and it was not an insignificant amount of money. Um, we went down from 15% from, from to 12.5%, which is a 17% reduction in the rate. And that we've, we've repeated that in order for us to go to the next step, it's exactly what the member from Castry South said. That is supposed to be a standard rate. But as was pointed out, their government had three rates. 15%, 10%, and zero. And, and we, we sit here, and I say this as parliamentarians, really with the greatest amount of respect, believing that by having a zero-rated item is somehow that we're helping a poor person in this country. We don't. We're not helping them. We can fool ourselves into thinking that that's the case. Even when we talk about that we're going to subsidize rice, flour, and sugar, so a Martinican can come over here and buy uh, subsidized rice, flour, and sugar. Hoteliers and wealthy people can buy it. That does not work. And so what we've said is we have to go to a singular ID and create a direct social program to help those people that need even this idea of this poverty list that we have of 2,200 people. Does anybody really believe for one minute that we only have 2,200 poor people in this country? No. But we have 2,200 because that's what the budget can afford. And that has to change. And that's what this government stands for every day about creating an e-government platform with a singular ID, Mr. Speaker. And we now can distribute support to those people who need and the people can't double dip and the people who live in households with different names that we know who they are we know how many children that are out there that need help and what kind of help they need and once we have done that then the goal is to reduce that again and when we get to reduction in that the discussions that we've had with the world bank and the imf and it's a simple question this is not overly complicated you don't need a phd degree for this is it better off to have a VAT system at 10% as an example? Because the benefit of that is you pay VAT at the point of entry and then it, when it's made its sale. And it's a value added tax. It was designed for countries that produce a lot of products, things that come in, inputs that come in that are unassembled. But the majority of items that we purchase in this country are already assembled. So in essence, we are penalizing our private sector because our private sector are having to pay the VAT at the entry point. And all they're doing is transporting it from the, 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 the dock to put it onto a warehouse shelf. So the only added value is human input and transportation. 
So the question becomes, is it better to have a sales tax? And what is the value of that sales tax? And those are the discussions that are taking place with the World Bank and IMF. And members on the opposite side would know that all of these things are dialogues that take place. Even the idea when we decided to reduce the VAT to 12.5%, when we decided to put the airport tax from $25 to $98, when we agreed to put the gas tax on, these were hard negotiations with the World Bank and IMF. And we didn't necessarily get their support, but we found a solution in order for them to allow us to go ahead. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We were right. They indicated that tourism arrivals would have gone down. Instead, tur tourism arrivals went up by 11%. They indicated that we would have seen, like the opposite members on the opposite side, the tax revenues would have dropped by 55 million. They dropped by 15 million. And within 18 months, we had fully recovered what we had given up. So what does that mean mathematically, Mr. Speaker? If, in fact, you're earning the same amount of money you were with a 15% VAT rate, it means that there was more sales. And people want to know why is it unemployment went down? Because businesses were allowed to grow. They were allowed to grow. That is what happened. You see? But you see, members on the opposite side always have an excuse for everything. But when they were in government and unemployment was increasing, the economy was contracting, and the debt was going up, what was this, what was it, what would they have to say? The world was a disaster. Always somebody else's problem. The difference is that this, this United Workers' Party government has a tradition of accepting responsibility and finding solutions to benefit the people of this country. Talk about what help that we gave to the workers of this country. The first primary one. The workers of this country, Mr. Speaker, who were badly hit, 15,000 direct workers, and probably another 10 or 15,000 people who were directly involved because of COVID, right? Very tough job, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members. And so, Mr. Speaker, the saddest part is to see that happening and, not to, and to know that there was not a lot that you could have done. And that's why we're so grateful of the solution of NIC, that NIC was able to step in and provide people with some support. I believe the amount was almost $80 million, Mr. Speaker, that was given. Another 15 to $20 million for those people who did not have NIC contributions. And we gave them $500 each for three months. We never said that that was a panacea. This was simply to be able to allow people, Mr. Speaker, to be able to put food on their table. That's what it was about. Who, who planned this crisis? Who? Who foresaw this crisis coming? Where do you go, Where do you go and find out what the solutions are? So I'm, I'm so happy that what we did, Mr. Speaker, is we put our heads together and came up with a, sol a solution, not only from a health perspective that has been revered by everybody in this region and around the world, but also an economic solution. And so the fact that, Mr. Speaker, that our tax revenues are back is an indication that the economy is on a rebound and that we are heading in the right direction. The fact that we're able to open up our hotels and keep our borders open. So instead of members on the other side looking to abate the kind of false news that is taking place, gain support of having to coexist with COVID. They just take whatever position that they want. Anything that is contrary to the government, that's it. It doesn't really matter how it affects people, Mr. Speaker. We have to keep our doors open. We have to keep our businesses going. The secret here is the discipline within our society to follow the simple protocols that we've put together. The Taiwanese people have shown that they can do that. 230 days with no new cases. Luckily for them, they had SARS. But the fact is, we're in this long enough that as people looking to put our country first and to take care of ourselves, how is it so difficult for persons to wear face masks? 
How is it so difficult for persons to continue to practice social distancing? And when we're saying for the next 30 days, as we said, go to work and go home. But Mr. Speaker, I heard my member, member I was talking about Beaufort South. I was, in, I was in the South. I couldn't believe what I saw. Okay? Couldn't see it. Couldn't believe it. So Mr. Speaker, we can control our own destiny. We need to be speaking with a singular voice. And I'm asking the members on the opposite side to stop the charade, stop the pretenses, stop the petty politics. You're embarrassing yourselves. You are embarrassing yourselves. It's shameful. It is shameful what is taking place with members on the other side. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member from Labry asked a very important question. Um, the reduction from the 10% to 7% would, in our estimation, reduce government income somewhere between 13 to $18 million. We did look at including the other ancillary services, but when we realized if we gave the 3% to the ancillary services, they would not be contributing back to the fund. So it really would have been a net gain for them and we intend to benefit them in a different direction. That would have been in excess of $22 million. And we're hoping, and he can do the calculation based on three and six dollars a night per person, um, that we're hoping that the tourism authority is going to be able to get um, anywhere between 25 and 30 million dollars back um, on the on the head tax. So, Mr. Speaker, um, with that, I just want to say one last thing: is that again, the member from Cast Three South talked about the protection of jobs. Um, many of the hoteliers, in, even in this difficult period, chose to make staff redundant. And I heard some persons trying to make that out to be a negative thing. Redundancy was paid to people so they had money in their pocket. Not to fire people, but to put money in their pocket. And I want to thank, and I know the Minister of Labor played an instrumental role in meeting with those hoteliers and encouraging as many of them that could do it to pay the redundancy because that became cash in their pocket. And this idea that hoteliers are out advertising overseas, I certainly would want to see that. But again, it pales in comparison to the point that the member from Castries Southeast brought up in the range agreement. That you on one hand, Mr. Speaker, would come to this house and talk about you care about the workers of this country, that you want to see a more integrated and beneficial um, uh, incentive system to protect the workers, and yet you would, you would, have, been, you would have been part of an agreement because you were the person as a High Commissioner and as CIP that was intimately involved in bringing range to St. Lucia. And you would know exactly, for, for the member to say that he doesn't know what the agreement says, really? That, he, that not only, he's never, once, he's never once admitted or said anything as to the fact that you would have signed an agreement six days before the election. We're talking about after Parliament was prorogued. Be six days before June 6th, May 30th, that you signed an agreement. And a part of that agreement was that you were going to allow the developer not only to bring workers in for construction, Mr. Speaker, but at 40% of the workers were allowed to come in from abroad to be in the oh, I never remember. That is unheard of, Mr. Speaker. We have never seen that in the history of this country. And this is, this is the kind of representation that the people of St. Lucia had. That's why I said... SLP stands for secrets, lies, and propaganda. Whether, whether, whether it is Jufali, whether it is Rochamel, whatever it is, Minister, that is Minister, what happens. Prime Minister, on, 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 Honorable Leader of the Opposition and Member, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Continue, Mr. Frank. So, Mr. Speaker, um, on that point, I want to say that this is part um, of a larger bill and that what we're proposing to do is to reduce the VAT rate from 10% from to 7%. The 3% will be now replaced with an absolute tax, which will be charged on a per head basis. And instead of that money going into the general coffers of the country, it will now be going in directly to the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. The benefit that we get, one, is no longer is the, tour, is the government having to allocate monies on an annual basis to its budget. Two, it's going to create a much more efficient um, tourism authority, and three, that we all now know that the tourists are paying for the marketing of this destination. These are not monies to be confused with regular tax revenues that we're getting. Uh, VAT revenues, duties, airport taxes, uh, fuel taxes, 
PAYE taxes, all of these are contributing significantly um, to the benefit of, of the people of this country. Just in the airport tax alone, Mr. Speaker, increasing the tax from $25 to um, $98 on 430,000 passengers, Mr. Speaker, that's $80 million of incremental tax revenue that came into this country through the tourism sector. And this is why it was so important that this aspect be tax neutral, because we have significantly increased the taxes in, in a way that is a responsible way. It's being collected on the airport tax. We don't have to get into any confusion as to how much is owed to the government. And this is a much more efficient way, and it allowed it to be so we were not uncompetitive. Why? Because other islands in the region, in this region, the average airport tax is in excess of $90. In some cases, as high as $120, $130. So it means that we were giving money to the airlines that we were not getting a benefit from. And so this money now is going in to help build the international airport. It's going in to help um, support the marketing initiatives, building of schools, and all of the incremental revenue that, uh, expenditure that you've been seeing has been driven out of these revenue streams that the government created. The government didn't just go borrow money out of its existing operations. It generated new revenue streams. And that's why you had the economy growing, unemployment being reduced, and the debt to GDP going down. That's why people were looking to invest in this country, because they saw that this country finally was being managed properly and in an effective way. And our policies were working to the benefit of everyone in this country. So again, Mr. Speaker, um, I thank all members for their support on this initiative, and I look forward to the continuing debate this afternoon um, on the, uh, uh, the other parts of this bill that are yet to come, the levy, as well as the amendment to the Tourism Authority Act. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax rate of tax tourism, tourism sector goods and services order to vary the rate of tax for goods and services provided by a hotel or and other providers in the tourism sector to set the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services as follows. A. The rate of 7% tax applies with regard to a supply of a tourism accommodation service. B. The rate of 10% tax applies with regard to a supply of 1. Food and beverages, including alcoholic beverages by a restaurant. 2. Water sports. 3. Tours conducted by land, air or sea within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of the tour package, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by a tour operator. 4. Admission to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg that we suspend the House for lunch for one hour. Honorable Members, the question is that the House do stand suspended for the next hour. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. House is suspended. So the Honourable House, the House of Assembly, has just been suspended for lunch. That is for the period of one hour. The House just concluded the forwarding of the motion. Be it resolved that Parliament, by affirmation resolution, approve the draft value added tax, rate of tax, tourism sector goods and services order to vary the rate of tax of all goods and services provided by a hotel and other providers in the tourism sector to set the rate of tax for tourism sector goods and services as follows. The rate of 7% tax applies with regard to a supply of a tourism accommodation service. 
The rate of 10% tax applies with regard to a supply of food and beverages, including alcoholic beverages, by a restaurant, water sports, tours conducted by land, sea, or air within St. Lucia, including a direct supply of transportation services by the tour operator as part of the tour package, but excluding an indirect supply of transportation services by a tour operator and admission to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. The Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs and the Public Service forwarded this motion in the Honorable House with his opening statements as well and it was followed by contributions to the debate by the representative for Castries East, Honorable Pierre, also the leader of the parliamentary opposition. The representative for Castries South, Honorable Dr. Hilaire. Uh, the member for Ancillary, Canaries, Honorable uh, Fede, Dominic Fede. And uh, Castries South East representative, Honorable Joseph. Uh, after lunch, we will see the continuation of uh, the parliamentary proceedings. And that will continue with uh, the motion of Parliament authorizing the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of the U.S. $13 million from the Caribbean Development Bank consisting of a special funds resource portion in the amount of $10,800,000 U.S. dollars and for and an ordinary capital resources portion in the amount of $19,200,000 U.S. dollars for the purpose of financing the implementation of policy reform initiatives designed to support St. Lucia's COVID-19 crisis response and achieving fiscal stability. Be it further resolved that in the case of the special funds or resource portion, the loan is repayable in 80 equal or approximately equal consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, and the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the loan agreement or a later date due date specific specified in writing by the Caribbean Development Bank. Interest is payable quarterly at a rate of 1% per annum on the amount of the special funds resources portion withdrawn and outstanding. B, in the case of the ordinary capital resources portion, the loan is repayable in 40 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date on the first day of January, April, July, and October on each year commencing on the first due date after the expiration of two years following the date of the loan agreement or a later due date specified in writing by the Caribbean Development Bank. A later due date interest is payable quarterly at a rate of 4.1% per annum on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion withdrawn and outstanding. A commitment charge is payable quarterly at a rate of 1% per annum on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion unwithdrawn or accrues from the 60th day following the date of the loan agreement. And this motion, uh, this $30 million U.S. loan from the CDB is to meet the budgetary shortfall given that government revenues have fallen uh, by over 60%. And it is also to meet increased costs in the health sector as a result of COVID-19. Also, it will be going toward supporting households at multiple levels that are affected by unemployment due to COVID-19, as well as micro and macro initiatives to build back the economy. So that is the next motion that is uh, on deck for being discussed in the Honorable House. We also have the tourism levy and the finance, the public finance management bill. Uh, the public finance management bill being forwarded later today is not new as it was presented in Parliament in 2017 and since then it has been reviewed by both the public and private sector stakeholders. Uh, the finance bill sets rules and processes that will direct government in mobilizing and spending of funds. So we do encourage you to tune in in one hour when we see the resumption of the parliamentary proceedings right here in downtown Castries. Stay tuned.